Welcome you to this service of worship here on the first Sunday of April. It is the second Sunday of Easter. 
and we're glad you're here with us. Uh, many times the Sunday immediately following Easter is one of those low Sundays because everybody celebrated last weekend and they're like, hey, it'll be there. Uh, but we're glad you're here. We're glad you're here. We have uh, a couple of things going on today that are a little bit different. So we, we're glad you made an attempt to be out with us this morning, whether in person or online, because we know that when we gather together, that God is good all the time. and all the time. God is good. This morning, we'll be celebrating Holy Communion as it's the first Sunday of the month. But we also uh, want to have just a couple of announcements and then I have something to to share with you all uh, regarding the white rose that's over here this morning in memory of Verda May Dooley. I'd also like to remind everyone that beginning here in April, our office hours are now just Monday through Thursday, 9 to 1. The office is closed on Fridays. So uh, if you do have a pastoral emergency, please do the best you can to, to leave a message here in the office. We'll try to pick them up over the weekend or feel free to call me at home. Uh, most all of you have our landline number and know how to get a hold of me if you, if you need to. I'd also like to share with you all, you hopefully got a handout this morning that uh, this coming Saturday, April the 13th, will be our work day here at the church from nine to noon. There'll be some window washing, some yard cleanup, et cetera. And uh, Phyllis Hill, our chair of trustees is just asking, even if you can just show up for an hour, that'd be great. That would be just wonderful to help out with them. Um, our missions team is no longer collecting uh, spaghetti sauce. We're just now focusing on some items for sheltered ink. The list is both in the April newsletter and available over there at the missions table in the fellowship hall if you'd like to check on that. And we'd like to congratulate Etta Springetti. Uh, she was named the Shining Student Spotlight for Northeastern Local School District. And uh, Etta, believe it or not, is now little Etta. <laughs> it's now a freshman at Kent Ridge. So uh, we do congratulate her on her achievement. As I mentioned this morning, uh, we, we have lost one who was very important to our, the life of our church uh, in Verna May Dooley. And uh, while she passed away back on March 15th, uh, the family situation was one to where uh, there were to be no services to be held. And knowing that Holy Week was coming, Easter and all, uh, I just said, let's wait and pause until after Easter. Well, this morning I'd like to spend just a few minutes. It's not my normal, please understand, uh, I'm not here to usurp anything that the family desired, nor that would have been Verna May's desires but I did feel that it was appropriate for me to just share a few words uh, on her behalf to help bring closure for us as part of the body of Christ. Because uh, whether you know this or not, Verna May was very instrumental in the life of this church in two different ways. She was born back on January 4th, 1932 in Urbana, Ohio. She was the daughter of Sylvan P. and N. Catherine Rocket Baker. Many of you may have remembered or known that she was first married to Robert Dybert, and they had a daughter, Rhonda. And I mention this because Robert and Verna May were charter members of this church. We have the records that they were received into membership with the first class of this church back on January 19th of 1958. This church was very important to Verna May for many years, and it was somewhat a family affair as Verna May's sister, Joyce Allishire, and her husband and some of his relatives were also charter members of this church. Church records show that Robert and Verna May sang in the first senior choir back in 1958, and I had no idea that she uh, sang with us or had been part of the choir before. Now later, Verna May married Leland Dooley, 
who was also a part of Northridge UMC, according to the pictorial directories from the mid-1980s. I did not see anything or find anything, but I do know that he was at least involved then, and our church historian, Phyllis Hill, may be able to tell you that it was even prior to then. Well, you may not have known that Verna May retired from Midland Ross Grimes Division in Urbana after 30 years as an executive secretary, which fits right in with her wanting to, to look very pristine whenever she was out and about. She also worked for the city of Springfield uh, in, their, in the city school system as a full-time and part-time secretary. And in addition to being a member here at this church, she belonged to the Elks Lodge number 151 in Springfield and the Order of Eastern Star. I personally got to know Verna May as not only a regular supporter of this church, but also as a consistent member of our Wednesday morning Bible study. In fact, she almost always arrived first. I could always tell, even though Bible study started at 11, uh, I could usually count, unless something was going wrong, and then she'd always tell me about it, but I could almost always count that sometime between 20 and a quarter till 11, she would be parking her car and being the first one in. Uh, she always had a smile on her face and a warm greeting regardless of the weather, even though she was not a cold weather person. She always wanted to know how my family was doing and cared deeply about her faith in God through Jesus Christ. I got to see her several times uh, following her stroke and she and I talked on numerous occasions on how she was ready to just go see Jesus. And I know that was a deep part of her faith. Her survivors include daughter Rhonda Lynn Diver, three, three stepdaughters, Barbara Ann uh, Neidhart, Patricia Ann Scott, and Brenda K. Long, as well as the close friends of the Hirsches who are uh, with us this morning in worship for this purpose as well as enjoying our fellowship together as part of the body of Christ. She was preceded in her death by Leland, her husband, in 2011, and two siblings, Joyce Alashir and Lamar Baker, and she will be missed by those who loved her. Let us pray. God of love, we thank you for everything with which you have blessed us even to this day for the gift of joy in days of health and strength, and for the gifts of your abiding presence and promise in days of pain and of grief. We praise you, O oh God, for home and friends and for our place with all who have faithfully lived and died. And we thank you for your child, Verna May, who by her love and kindness showed us all how to be about the business which God created us for. Above all else, we thank you for Jesus, who knew our griefs, who died our death, and rose for our sake, and who lives and prays for us this very day. For we pray this all in his holy name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Bernabe will be missed, and she has been deeply loved by many. Now we transition back into our worship service that's a little more accustomed to where we are when we gather together on a Sunday morning. I would ask now that you would rise as you were able and hear these words of centering as we begin our worship together. The risen Christ comes to us and says, peace be with you. May we lay down the worries of our lives to welcome the peace of Christ. Please join with me in the words of praise. It is good for God's people to gather together in unity. We are here at the invitation of God. In this place, God's love and grace flow into our lives. In this place, God's blessings abound. Praise be to God. Praise be to God.
Please join with me in the opening prayer. Holy One, we gather with grateful hearts to remember the blessings of your light and love as they flow through our lives each day. In this moment, open our hearts to your Holy Spirit. Open our minds to the truth of your story. Open our hands to welcome the risen Christ among us. And open our eyes to your glory, a glory reflected in the faces around us. In the name of the risen Christ, we pray. Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. Is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and in the life everlasting. Amen. expensive oil poured over the head, running down into the beard, Aaron's beard, which extended over the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Mount Hermon, streaming down into the mountains of Zion, because it is there that the Lord had commanded the blessing, everlasting life. up here or not, but here we are. <laughs> well, good morning. How are you today? Are you good? Okay, so we're going to think back for just a minute. Last week, what was last week? Do you remember what last week was? What was last Sunday? Easter, that's right. And did you do anything for Easter? What'd you do for Easter? Um, well, when I was at my um, grandparents house we did this thing where like you open the easter egg and inside it was like something that represents jesus so like they had like a little thorn branch which represented the crown of thorns and like a little cross that represented the cross that's awesome the res the like the resurrection eggs where it had the story of jesus yes those are awesome what did you do did you do the same thing mm -hmm. did you okay anything else you did last week And what did you do last week? Um, we hunted for Easter eggs. 
Spreading through Easter eggs. That's good. Okay, so we had Easter last Sunday. Why did we have Easter last Sunday? Do you know? Ah. Because that's when Jesus raised from the dead. That's right. Jesus rose from the dead. And he died for all of us. And so we, so we can have eternal life. And when we do go to heaven, we can be in heaven with him, right? Okay, so I have a question for you. Do you by any chance know what the book of Ripley's Believe It or Not is? Have you ever heard of that book? Yes, no? I bet a lot of people out here have heard of it. I was hoping to have one. My husband, I thought he had one, but he didn't. So, you know, Bob always keeps all that different stuff. But anyway. <laughs> anyway, so we're going to play a game, okay? All right. Have you ever done this? Thumbs up, yes. Thumbs down, no. You know, those types of games. Okay. Well, I found some stuff in the Ripley's Believe It or Not book. Okay, and when I say it, I want you to do thumbs up if you think it's true, thumbs down if you don't think it's true. Okay, are you ready? All right, you got your thumbs ready to go? Okay, here we go. A man once had a chicken that laid a perfectly square egg. What do you think? Yes or no? Hmm? It does, you, you can't have a wrong answer. Do you know what? That is true. According to Ripley's Believe It or Not, it is true. I've never seen a square egg, have you? But they say it's true, does, isn't it? Okay, here's the second one. A 15-year-old from California had a lot of hula hoops around their body. She had 68 hula hoops that she was able to do, you know, this that I can't do, you know? She had them going around her body, 68 of them at the same time. What do you think? True or not true? It's true. It's true. Yes, it is. Okay, last one. Now, this is, this one I had to laugh when I did this one, so let's see if you think it's funny. It's about a hot dog, all right? The longest hot dog was over 3,000 feet long and weighed 885 pounds. And it took 103 butchers. You know what a butcher is? Somebody that slices the meat up. It took 103 butch butchers to carry it. Yes or no? What do you think? You're right, it's true. <laughs> Can you imagine a hot dog that's 3,000 feet long? That would be as longer than this church. Yeah, longer than a football field, yeah, maybe. Okay, um, I have to figure out my math on that if anybody can tell me. So <laughs> okay, so, do you see some of these fascinating facts that seem like, oh my gosh, that can't be true, but it's true, right? So if you ever get a chance to read Ripley's Believe It or Not, there's all kinds of interesting facts that are true that we can't believe, that we don't think so. So like we said on Easter Sunday, Jesus rose from the dead, right? Did we see him raise from the dead? No, but we know it's <clears throat> true. Yes, we do. And you know what? Then Jesus went to his disciples, okay? And the disciples saw, disciples saw him, but there was one disciple, Thomas, that didn't see him. So when they told Thomas that they saw Jesus and he's alive, what do you think he said? Yeah. No, I don't believe it. You're right. I don't believe it because I didn't see it. Okay. So later on, Thomas saw Jesus and Jesus had him, showed him where the nails were and showed him his, you know, where he had been crucified. What do you think Thomas thought then? Yeah, can you 
say that again so everybody can hear? I love that. So what? Jesus is like the only one that could have raised from the dead, and since he saw that there was the marks on his hands, he knew it was him. Very good. Yes, that's true. So our story today is just because we didn't see Jesus raised from the dead, and just because Thomas didn't see him at first, do we still want to believe that Jesus is alive for us today? Yes, we do. Because you know what? We have our faith, and we know that. We never saw it, but we know that, and we're going to keep that in our mind and in our heart, right? Can you do that this week? All right, and if anybody asks you what Easter is about, what are you going to tell them? Yes, Jesus rose from the dead, okay? All right, can we say our prayer now? One, we do this. One, two, three. Thank you, okay. Dear Jesus, thank you that you help us accept by faith that you had risen from the dead and that you are alive for us today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Very good. Phyllis is going to take you to Children's Church. You can go over there and do some activities, okay? Thank you for coming today. come to that time now in our worship service where we have uh, an opportunity to go directly to God through our prayers. Not only the prayers requests that have been given to me, but the prayers that are in our own hearts. I have several to share with you this morning that have been given to me either through the week or even this morning. We would like to lift up prayers for uh, Kay Ruley. Kay is recovering from minor surgery to remove a pin from her left foot and she is resting at home and we want to lift up prayers for her as well as her husband Jim as she continues to recover from that minor surgery. We would also like to lift up prayers for Matt Shepard, a classmate of and friend uh, classmates friend of Karen Grube and Matt is scheduled for quintuple bypass surgery on Tuesday of this week, so we want to lift up prayers for him. We also want to lift up prayers for Evelyn Marshall. Uh, she had surgery this last week to remove uh, some cancerous spots from her forehead, and a large piece of tissue was removed and now must heal, and so we want to lift up healing prayers for her. We also want to lift up prayers of thanksgiving for her son Jeff, as his biopsies were negative and he continues to remain cancer free. We also want to lift up prayers for Don Toops and the family of Nancy Schultz Toops. Nancy passed away back on April 1st and uh, I will be uh, part of the service. Her viewing will be Wednesday, uh, April the 10th at Jackson Lytle Lewis from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m and I will be officiating the funeral that will begin again at Jackson Lytle Lewis at 1 p.m. 
We also have uh, continued prayers that uh, we want to lift up uh, Amy, Glenn and Dolores, baby Owen, Nina, Jackie, Karen, Nancy, uh, Betty Thacker, as well as uh, prayers continue for all of those who were uh, had to deal with the recent tornado disasters throughout Ohio, but especially up around Indian Lake in Logan County. With all of that being said and shared, I would ask now that you would come to God as we pray together our prayer of confession. Let us pray in unison. God of grace and mercy, we want to continue singing the Alleluia's of Easter, but there are days we just don't feel like singing. Sometimes we lock ourselves away, fearful of what has happened or what the day may bring. Sometimes we allow our doubts to overwhelm our faith. Sometimes we forget about the needs of our neighbors because we are so focused on ourselves. Forgive us, draw us back to you and to one another. Help us walk in your love and light that others may see in us the loving presence of the risen Christ. For it is in his holy name we pray, amen. Hear these words of assurance, family of God and friends of Christ. Jesus promises, if you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. Receive the hope and promise of this good news, for forgiveness is ours when we forgive one another. For that, we can all say, thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we do come this day. We come this day from many different places. We come this day for many different reasons, but may the most important reason of why we are gathered this day would simply be to worship you, to bring your love into our lives and reflect that love back to one another. We do thank you for bringing us together this day. We thank you for those who have been brought to us either by, by habit, by witness, or even by curiosity. For, oh God, we know that you are a mighty God. And through the rising of our Lord and Savior, your Son, Jesus the Christ, we have good news to share with the world. May that good news not be lost simply because the day we celebrate called Easter is now past. Help us to understand, O oh God, that yes, we are to be resurrection people going forward, that this is a season of celebration, regardless of where we might feel, where we might be in our own lives, the sadness, the hardships, the hurts, the pains, May they all be overcome by the jewel we have in knowing that Christ has risen for each and every one of us. We do thank you again, O oh God, for gathering us as you gather your sheep, as a hen would gather her chicks. And we pray now that as we come to you, that you would hear our individual prayers as we take this moment of silence to talk directly with you. Thank you, O oh Lord, for hearing the prayers we have lifted up in the name of Jesus Christ, our risen Savior and Lord. For it's in his name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. At this time, I would ask that you would turn your attention as we have some special music for this morning. Oh, no. 
God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jane and John. Our scripture lesson this morning is taken from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. As many of you may have gathered already, this is the story of Thomas and the disciples, but this morning we're focusing more on the appearance of Jesus with his disciples. Hear these words from the Gospel of John. It was still the first day of the week that evening while the disciples were behind closed doors because they were afraid of the Jewish authorities when Jesus came and stood among them. He said, peace be with you. And after said this, he showed them his hands and his side and when the disciples saw the Lord, they were filled with joy. And Jesus said again to them, Peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you don't forgive them, they aren't forgiven. Now Thomas the one called Didymus, one of the twelve, wasn't with the disciples when Jesus came. The other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But he replied, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger in the wounds left by the nails and put my hand into his side, I won't believe. After eight days, his disciples again were in a house and Thomas was with them. Even though the doors were locked, Jesus entered and stood among them, and he said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. Look at my hands. Put your hand into my side. No more disbelief. Believe. Thomas responded to Jesus, My Lord and my God. And Jesus replied, Do you believe because you see me? Happier those who don't see and yet believe. Then Jesus did many other miraculous signs in his disciples' presence, signs that aren't recorded in this scroll. But these things are written so that you will believe that Jesus is the Christ, God's Son, and that believing you will have life in his name. The Word of God for the people of God. Would you pray with me, please? Gracious and loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock, our redeemer, the savior of the world. Come now, Holy Spirit, be among us. Help us to listen, not just with our head, not just with our ears, but truly with our hearts and our souls, and our spirits, for the words you would have me to say this day. For it is in the name of Jesus we pray all these things, and all God's people said, Amen. Well, there was one time a bus driver and a preacher. They were standing in line to get into heaven. The bus driver approached the gate and St. Peter said to him, Welcome, 
I understand you were a bus driver. Since I'm in charge of housing, I believe I have found the perfect place for you. See that mansion over the hilltop? It's yours. Now the preacher heard all of this and began to stand a little taller. He said to himself, if a bus driver got a palace like that, just think what I'll get. And the preacher approached the gate and St. Peter said, welcome. I understand you were a preacher. See that shack in the valley? St. Peter had hardly gotten out the words of his mouth when the irate preacher said, wait a minute, I was a preacher. I preached the gospel. I helped teach people about God. Why does that bus driver get a mansion and I get a shack? Sadly, St. Peter responded, well, it seems when you preached, people slept, and when the bus driver drove, people prayed. <laughs> okay, no sleeping. <laughs> oh, here we are this second Sunday of Easter the week after the holiest day of the year for followers of Jesus Christ. It's also considered one of the lowest attended Sundays of the year. Everyone pays close attention to Easter Sunday and then click, it's all over. Well, perhaps you are like many Protestant Christians who are not well attuned to Easter as being more than just a single Sunday in early spring. For many Protestant churches, expectations seem to return to something like business as usual. Okay, we had the Easter flowers, they're starting to wilt, it's time to take them out and let's move on. But nothing could be further from the truth. The Easter mystery, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ is the centerpiece of our Christian faith. This is one reason that I prefer to follow what is called the liturgical calendar. It's so we can continue to focus on the hope that Easter and the Easter season brings us. We're now in what the church calls Eastertide. Now, Eastertide devotes seven weeks to the Easter season and culminates in Pentecost which will be happening in the middle of May. The Sundays of this season are referred to not as Sundays after Easter, but they are Sundays of Easter. And this extension of the Easter celebration is to give us, the church, the body of Christ, time to embrace the message that Christ is alive. For 50 days, the church lives into the reality of the resurrection. For the next 50 days, the church focuses on what it means to be a community shaped by the dying and rising of Jesus Christ, by the expectation-shattering reality of life victorious over death. As we read from the Gospel of John, it was not easy. It was not easy for the first disciples to live into the reality of Easter. Everything in the pre-Easter experience made it difficult for them to embrace fully this good news. Perhaps the same thing can be true for us. Consider that even though Mary had told the disciples that very morning that she had seen the risen Lord, where do we find the disciples? They're huddled behind closed, locked doors. They are afraid of those who have power over them. They do not live boldly. They do not live empowered by a new reality. They instead act at best disenchanted, ready to move on once the coast is cleared and everything's died down. And at worst, they act like cowards. It's to this cowering group, followers of Jesus, 
that Jesus comes and reveals himself. Now, I can't explain how. I don't explain any of this particular appearance other than to say that Jesus is there behind locked and closed doors and says, peace be with you. More than likely, Jesus used what we would consider a Hebrew word called shalom. Now, the Hebrew word shalom is a very comprehensive word. It covers the full realm of relationships in daily life. It expresses an ideal state of life. According to the late Reverend Harry Huxold, the word shalom suggests the fullness, the completeness of well-being and harmony untouched by ill or bad fortune. The word as a blessing is a prayer for the best that God can give to enable a person to complete one's life with happiness and then a natural death. If the concept of shalom became all too casual and lighthearted with no more significance than a passing greeting, Jesus came in this moment at this time to give it new meaning. And that's what Jesus was doing throughout his ministry. The mission and ministry of our Lord made it quite clear that Jesus had come to introduce the rule of God and to order peace, not in the word we think as peace meaning nonviolence, just simply peace as completeness for the world. Because that's what Jesus said. I don't come to abolish the law. I come to fulfill, to complete the law. Well, after their joyous but probably short celebration, then Jesus commissions them to share in his ministry. According to the Gospel of John, unlike the Gospel of Matthew, followers of Christ are immediately commissioned to go out into the world, to share the good news. The disciples are then given the power of the Holy Spirit to be properly prepared for their new commissioning. Again, all this happening is on the evening of the resurrection. Now, this was a lot to take in. In just a few short minutes, Jesus appears and the disciples have gone from despondent to absolute joy, from directionless to the ultimate commissioning, from powerless to powerful. And it was based on this experience that the disciples announced to Thomas, oh, just like Mary had announced to them, we've seen the Lord. However, just like when they heard it from Mary the first time, Thomas does not believe. Now, there are many, many sermons preached about who we moniker Doubting Thomas. You've heard them. I've preached them. You'll hear them again, just not this year. What is most noteworthy for 21st century Christians is what follows. Yes, Thomas wanted physical evidence. There are times we desire that as well. However, we tend to miss the point. The point is that one week after the disciples have been visited by the risen Christ, one week after they have received peace from Jesus and received the Holy Spirit, where are they? They're still locked behind closed doors. Now, Thomas might just be a step ahead of the rest. He simply wants what they've already witnessed. That's all. The disciples have already received, yet still do not live as Easter people. And this second Sunday of Easter, we can be just like those first disciples. We get confused. We forget the basis of our faith. We cry out to God for proof. The Easter miracle, according to this passage in the Gospel of John, is that Jesus comes again 
and again to these scared and confused disciples. All the disciples have not warranted a second visit by Jesus, but they get one. They do not deserve a renewed blessing of peace from Jesus, but they get one. Then Thomas is given exactly what he has requested, a chance to see and touch Jesus for himself. Notice that the story does not tell us if Thomas actually touched Jesus or not. That's not the point. The point is Jesus' offer of himself over and over and over again to people, perhaps like us, who long to see him. When no questions asked, Jesus offers himself. Then Jesus gives the repeated gift of his presence and his peace. While this is good news for the second Sunday of Easter, what about the third, and then the fourth, and then the fifth, and so on? Our human tendency, if we're honest, our tendency is to go back behind closed doors. Why? Because after the Easter celebrating wears off, Many Christians very quickly wonder about the staying power of Easter, the staying power of the resurrection. They wonder also about considering themselves as Easter people. Well, no, I'm just, I'm just kind of a Christian, sort of, maybe when it's convenient, uh, if I'm not embarrassed. Uh, really? I wonder if, like Christmas, we can, on Easter Sunday, hold at bay all those worries, all those concerns, all those doubts, and hand them over to the power of God through Jesus' resurrection. But then it, it doesn't take long for the vocabulary of death, gloom, and doom to creep back in, to push Easter out of the way, being afraid, Wanting more, perhaps even needing more, demanding more. None of this is unusual. Like the first disciples, we live this way too. We really do. Yes, the Easter good news turns the world upside down. Yes, though, we also continue to live in a right side up reality. So how do we deal with it? Friends, we're being invited time and time again into a resurrection story in which there is nothing great or admirable about the conduct of any of the disciples to whom Jesus appears. They live in fear even in the face of the Easter proclamation. Many times we continue to live in fear even though we already know the end of the story but they also are the ones to whom Jesus comes anyway and comes repeatedly. And that is the wonderful news for us because Jesus also comes to us repeatedly anyway. I would hope as we continue through the next six weeks that we will continue to look at the ways Easter is real. That's going to be our focus. Easter is not simply the triumphant celebrations of last Sunday. Easter is how living with the resurrected Christ continues to unfold in the lives and stories of the disciples who are regularly tempted, as are we, by fear and despair. This Sunday, we are witnesses to the vivid picture of real human beings, according to Scripture, the disciples, their needs and their wants. For you see, they were really no different than us. But we are also witnesses to the resurrected Christ in all the abundance of his grace. 
And we need to remember that the point of this story should not focus on the disciples and their frailties. No, Jesus never, never lectured them for hiding behind closed doors, even after receiving the Holy Spirit. Jesus never reprimanded Thomas for wanting visual, tangible proof of the risen Lord. Consider these scripture passages as examples of grace. Grace. Oh. Grace. For you see the importance of grace, even for those who don't see yet believe, shapes the proclamation of Easter, now and always. And we continue with that proclamation of Easter by coming together and sharing together in the meal that Jesus has shown for us and given for us. This is the meal that we come and share together. This is a meal that is given to us by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is a meal that we are all invited. No matter where we've been, no matter where we think we are, even no matter where we think we're headed. This is the table of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is not my table. This is not the table of the United Methodist Church. This is not the table of Northridge. This is the table of Jesus. And so we all are invited. For you see, friends, on the night in which Jesus betray was betrayed, he took bread. And after asking God's blessing over the bread, he broke it and gave it to his friends, his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body that's been given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, after the supper was over, Jesus took the common cup of the day, the fruit of the vine, and he asked God's blessing over it. And he gave it to his friends, his disciples, saying, Drink of this, all of you, all of you. For this is my blood that's been poured out and shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. And so, friends, we come now to this table. We come to the remembrance of what Jesus has done for us, but also knowing, also knowing Christ is with us, just like Christ was with those disciples. Christ is here asking us to come forward and share in this meal, in this time of remembrance, but also in this time of celebration. The celebration of our risen Lord. The celebration in the forgiveness of sins. The celebration in the sharing together of what God has done through Jesus Christ for each and every one of us. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we would ask that you would pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts of bread in the cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, knowing that we come to celebrate this day. We come to celebrate what you have done for us through his life, his teachings, his suffering, his passion, his death, his burial, and ultimately his resurrection. Come and be with us now, for it is in the name of Jesus we pray all these things. And with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The table is set. The meal has been prepared. As is tradition here at this church, we would ask as the ushers guide you to come to the center aisle and then come down forward and you may have an opportunity to either take a piece of uh, bread or cracker with a small cup of juice or prepackaged elements if you prefer to take it that way. As you come down to the center, we would ask you would return to your seats following the side aisles, and we will be singing together as we all are being served. Come, the meal is ready. Thank you. 
body of Christ broken for you eat in remembrance of him the blood of Christ shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins drink of this all of you in remembrance of him Gracious and loving God, as we go from this table, may we be renewed in our spirits, not only by the gifts of bread and the cup that you have given us, but through the power of your Holy Spirit, so that we may be Easter people, not just now, but always. For it is in the name of Jesus, our risen Savior, it's in his name we pray all these things, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. We now have an opportunity to give back to God and celebrate to God the gifts of our tithes, gifts, and offerings. Would you stand, please, as you were able? Abundant God, we are grateful for all your blessings, especially for the presence of the risen Christ. Bless these gifts that they may help bring your love and light into our community and our world. For it is in the name of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. We conclude our time together with Christ has risen.
And now with the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit, I call you all to go forth into the world. Yes, going forth as Easter people now, next week, and the week after, and always go forth. Amen.